the teach uh, the the Americans that are listening to us now. I mean, because that is uh, even in the context of uh, the the piece I just cited, there's not necessarily a, a a you know it's it's time to try socialism, but there's not really a clear definition as to what what that it is means. Exactly. Yeah, so give us and a that, sense of like what, what what would that look like, and because um, you know where are we in the development of socialism? I mean, it's uh, like you, you're suggesting it's maybe uh, the concept is not as associated with statism in the same way that it was 40, 50 exactly. years ago. But, but, uh, but where, what would it be? I mean, if, if, if we could hand it over to you for a day and maybe that's not necessarily how it, it should work uh, process wise, <laughs> I guess that's the point, but, but what would be the roadmap? If people were going right. to vote on it, what would they be voting on? Well, I will answer the question, but before I do, I want to put all the honesty I can into the answer and to say that socialists don't agree on this subject. In other words, if, if you ask me what is the socialist alternative, I can't answer that question because there isn't one. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example, after 1989, the big changes in China, in Cuba, in Vietnam have made all socialists have to go back, in a sense, to the drawing boards to rethink what they mean. Those societies did not uh, survive in the way that they had been prior to, say, 1985 or 1990. And, and you have to face that. You can't pretend that this didn't happen. So that socialists have been arguing and debating and changing what they think, and they aren't all of a mind at this moment, I will tell you what I think in answer to your question, but I wouldn't want it to be misunderstood that what I'm about to say is the universally agreed notion. Having said that, let me tell you what it means to me. It does not mean, let me begin by saying, it does not mean what it once did. It does not mean that the state becomes the owner-operator of uh, factories and farms and offices and stores. Uh, whatever that experience was, in the 20th century. It had good results, for sure. It also had awful results. And the awful results had a lot to do with giving the state that much power that would allow it then to abuse that power in ways that we're all too familiar with. So socialists have learned all of that. They are not stupid and they're not blind. And so one of the results has been to conceive of a transition to a, a situation better than and different from capitalism in the following alternative way. It becomes a focus on the workplace, that place where the adult, for example here, the adult American citizen, spends most of his or her life once you reach adulthood, five days of the week, you are working more and more. This is true of women as well as men. Uh, for all the reasons we know, and that the result is if a socialist alternative is visible, is projectable, well, then it has to do with the workplace. And here the idea then becomes pretty simple. We ought to be, as socialists, advocates for the democratization of the workplace. Having the workplace be the emblem of, the model of what democracy is. And by that I mean the following. If you are affected by a decision at the workplace, then you must, by rights, by democracy, have a role in making that decision. Just like we arrange that the mayor in our town, who has power to make decisions that affect us, must be in turn subject to our power, for example, at the ballot box, so that there's some control. We don't have that in the workplace. You go to work in the morning, you cross the threshold into your office, your factory, your store, and you enter a place where there is no democracy, where a tiny group of people, usually in a corporation, board of directors, major shareholders, that's 20, 25 people in most companies, those folks make all the decisions. They decide what you produce. They decide the technology of how you produce it. They decide the location of where the factory or the office will be, for example, in New York or in Shanghai or in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then most importantly, at the end of the, the year, they decide, this tiny group of people, 
what is to be done with the profits that all of you, all of the employees, helped to produce. This produces an economic system that is owned and operated by a tiny number of people who we now see all around us, make sure that this system is good for them. That's why the rich have gotten richer and the rest of us haven't. If you want an economic system to work for all the people, then you have to put all the people in charge. Otherwise, it won't work for the mass of people and will have the kind of lopsided inequality that has become worse across the last 40 years. For me, the socialist alternative has to do with this dramatic, radical, if you want to call it, transformation in which we do something which those of us who believe in democracy believe should have been done long ago, which is to bring democracy into the workplace. If it's good enough for the neighborhood you live in, the residential area you inhabit, then it ought to be applicable to your workplace as well. So, so, so how does that work in practice? So, um, the 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 government uh, passes a law that says ent- any entity that is chartered as a corporation uh, must have this built into their bylaws. I mean, how does that come about? Exactly. Did- Good. That's a great question. Let me answer it. Rather than speculating how it might be, let me tell you how, as it happens, the British Labour Party right now is doing that. Uh, Mr. Corbyn has as his chief economic spokesperson a man named John McDonnell, and he has articulated how they plan to do this in Great Britain when they win the next election. Here's the plan. Number one. It has two parts, so it's really not complicated. Number one, a law will be passed, just as you said, that will have the following provision. Any company in Great Britain, any factory, any office, any store, can continue as it is now for as long as it stays in its current form. But if it should come to the decision either to, one, close itself down, or two, sell itself Uh, to another company, or three, move out of Great Britain to another country, uh, or four, become a public country, company, uh, that is, issue shares and all of that, before it can make any one of those changes, it has to give, here comes the key point, it has to give what's called right of first refusal to its own workers to buy the company and convert it into a democratically owned and operated uh, worker co-op. And when he explains all of that, and the audience kind of takes it in, he then says, and I know what's in your mind, I'm going to tell you how we're going to solve problem number two, which is, Where are the workers going to get the money to enable themselves to buy that company? And he smiles and he says, that's when the government of Great Britain will lend the workers that money precisely in order to develop steadily over time a worker co-op sector of the British economy so that the British people can tangibly see the difference between working in a democratic workplace as opposed to the conventional capitalist hierarchical one, then the people can decide if they want to buy from the one kind of enterprise rather than the other because they support one or the other. That's how they're going to do it. That's not the only way to do it. It may not be the way we do it, but it is a practical way that this idea is already happening. It's the it's the functional equivalent of uh, what the public option was uh, supposed to be in the context of uh, the Affordable Care Act when that was proposed. I mean, on some level, right, where we have that's a, right. Uh, that's why it's it's basically saying we're going to widen the range of choices that people have. We're going to utilize. Uh, the the government to do that. I would caution people, because sometimes when I I explain this, there's a bit of a pushback when people say, well, the government is favoring them. I like to remind them as a professor of economic history that the capitalist sector of the American economy has been going to the government to help them in countless ways from from day one. All that's being said here is, what you have always done and continue to do for the capitalist sector, you ought also to match 
by enabling the cooperative alternative sector to show what it can do and to appeal to the American people to make a rational choice about their economic system rather than being forced to live in only well, one kind. The governments um, uh, pick winners and losers every single day. Uh, yeah. Just ask, uh, you know, uh, Gary Cohn, why he's so happy that he's only going to be paying 15 percent tax on his on right. his investments as opposed to uh, the, you know, the, the, the higher taxes we'll pay if it was wages. I mean, that's just uh, as a beginning.